Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Old Star. Lily is taking a leave here right now, but tonight we are going to get to the summary and analysis of uh, Harper Lee's The Kill a Mockingbird of chapters 19 to 24. And just as a reminder, if you would please subscribe, like, comment below, and hit the notification bell. And, all, and as always, please stay safe and healthy. And let's get to the video. To the... Chapter 19. Tom Robinson is called to the witness stand. He tries to put his left hand upon the Bible, but it is a futile effort as his left arm is entirely non-functional. The arm simply slips off the Bible again and again. Finally, the judge tells him his effort is sufficient and he can take the stand. Atticus questions Tom, first asking whether he has ever been convicted of a crime. Tom explains that he was once convicted of a fighting because he could not pay the fine that would have released him. In, a, in, a, in, a, in an aside, the narr narrator explains that Atticus is showing how honest Tom is and that he has nothing to hide from the jury. Next, Tom gives his account of the Yule incident. In Tom's version, he says he passed by the Yule house every day on his way to work at Mr. Link D's farm, where Tom picks cotton and does other farm work. Tom confirms that one day last spring, Miela asked him to chop up an old shiffer robe with a hatchet, but that was long before the November day in <coughs> question. And just recall that shiffer robe is like a chest of drawers. After Tom performed that favor for her, Miela often asked him to help her with odd jobs around the house as he passes by, passed by. She offered him a nickel the first time, but he refused payment, knowing that the family had no money. He said he helped her out because she didn't seem to have anyone else to help her, and that he never went out to the Yule property without being invited. The scout thinks about how lonely Miela is. She's so poor that white people won't befriend her, but black people will avoid her because she's white. Atticus asks about the events on November 21st of the, that year. Tom says that he passed the Yule house as usual and everything seemed very quiet. Miela asked him to come inside and fix a broken door, but when he got inside the door, the door didn't look broken. Then Miela shut the door behind him and said, she had sent the children to town to get ice cream, having saved for a long time to be able to give each to give each child a nickel. Tom starts to leave, but she asks him to take a box down from on top of another shiffer rope. As Tom reached for the box, Mayla grabbed him around his legs. He was so startled that he overturned a chair. Next, she hugged him around the waist and kissed his cheek, and as Tom explains, that said that <coughs> she never kissed a grown man before, and she might as well kiss a negro. She says what her pap do to her don't count. Oof. Miela asks him to kiss her back, and Tom asks her to let him out of the house. However, her back is to the door, and he doesn't want to force her to move. He knows that as a black man, if he lays a hand on her, he could later be killed. Then Mr. Ewell arrives, happens upon the scene, calls his daughter a goddamn whore, and tells her he will kill Tom. Tom runs away in fear. Mr. Gilmore questions Tom next and he does so fairly aggressively, addressing him only as boy. Mr. Gilmer tries to get at Tom's motivation for helping Mayella, insinuating that he must have had ulterior motives for helping her. Tom finally says he just tried to help because he felt sorry for her, which stirs up the audience considerably, as it is unacceptable for a black man to feel sorry, sorry for a white woman. Mr. Gilmer asks whether Tom thinks Mayella was lying about asking him to chop up the chiffer robe in November. Tom avoids a potential trap by saying he thinks Miela must be mistaken <coughs> in her mind about this and everything else. Mr. Gilmer asks why Tom ran if he had a clear conscience. And Tom said he was afraid of being tried in court for not what he did, for, not for what he did, but for what he didn't do. At this point, Dill starts crying. Scout takes him outside the courthouse. He says he can't bear to watch Mr. Gilmer behaving so disrespectful toward Tom. Scout says that all lawyers do that, and Mr. Gilmer doesn't, didn't even seem to be trying as usual today. Dill points out that Atticus isn't like that. A sympathetic voice behind them agrees that it makes him sick, too. They turn to see Mr. Dolphus Raymond. Chapter 20. Mr. Dolphus Raymond is known as the town drunk because he always carries his drink in a brown paper bag and tends to sway a bit in his walk. Hey, Jamie. Mr. Raymond is also married to a black woman and has mixed children. <laughs> Got another kitty on here. 
and has mixed children. When running from the courthouse, Dill and Scout run into Mr. Raymond, and he offers Dill a sip of his drink. Scout is wary, but Mr. Raymond promises Dill it will make him feel better. Remember, it's only Coca-Cola. <laughs> Dill takes a sip and discovers Mr. Raymond is hiding a bottle of Coca-Cola in his infamous paper bag. Scout asks why he does such a thing, and Mr. Raymond explains he feels he has to give the population some reason for his odd behavior. Being friendly toward black people. Mr. Raymond believes it is easier for people to handle strangeness when they have a reason to explain it. Thus, he pretends to be a drunkard. He says he thinks that children like Dill, who is so upset over the trial, haven't lost the instinct that tell them that it is wrong for white people to give hell to black people without consideration for their basic humanity. Scout and Dill return to the courtroom, where Atticus is beginning his speech to the jury. Atticus explains that the case is very simple because there is no medical evidence and very questionable testimony to prove Tom's guilt. Atticus explains that Miela has broken a rigid and time-honored code of our society by attempting to seduce a black man. He acknowledged her poverty and ignorance, but says, I cannot pity her. She is white. I mean, it sounds to me like she probably couldn't. She was very lonely and didn't, no one else wanted her, and so she figured she'd try to go with a black man. That she just sounds like a very lonely person, but still not right what she tried to do. And then she ends up in the end, I think, getting him killed, as you can see. He explains that Miela followed her desires, even though she was aware of the social taboos against her actions. Having broken one of society's strictest codes, she chose to put the evidence of her offense, namely Tom Robinson, away from her by testifying against him. Atticus, is, Atticus accuses Mel of trying to rid herself of the source of her own guilt. Atticus suggests that Mr. Yule beat his own daughter, as shown by Miela's bruising on her right side. Mr. Yule leads predominantly with his left. While Tom can't punch with his left hand at all, Atticus points out that the case comes down to the word of a black man against the word of the white people, and that the Yule's case depends upon the jury's assumption that all black men lie. Uncharacteristically, Atticus loosens his tie and removes his jacket, which Scout and Gemma are astounded to see, because he never walks about so casually. In his final remarks, Atticus speaks directly to the jury, earnestly reminding them that there are honest and dishonest black people, just as there are honest and dishonest white people. He tells the jury that in a court of law, all men are created equal. The court is, however, no better than the members of the jury, and he urges the jury to do their duty. As his speech comes to a close, Scout and Jem see Calpurnia moving toward the front of the court. Chapter 21 Summary Calpurnia arrives with a note for Atticus from Aunt Alexandra, who is concerned that the children have been gone all day. The court witnesses this exchange, and then the children are pointed out to Atticus. He sends the children home, but allows them to return to hear the jury's verdict after they eat their dinner. The children return home, where Aunt Alexandra is sad to here that the three of them, particularly Scout, were at the courthouse. Everyone eats and then walks back to court. The jury is still deliberating, but the courthouse is still packed. Usually people leave to go eat or walk around the square, but due to the weightiness of this case, everyone has stayed inside the courthouse, eagerly awaiting the decision. Everyone is silent and still, and Scout feels the sensation of chilliness in the room. Finally, the jury returns. Scout notices not, not a single member of the jury looks at Tom, and she takes this as a bad sign. Smart child. Meanwhile, she and Jem can't believe that anyone could convict Tom because he is so clearly innocent. Judge Taylor pulls the jury, and every man declares Tom guilty. Atticus witnesses, whispers something to Tom that exits the courtroom. All the black people in the balcony rise to their feet to honor Atticus as he passes them. Chapter 22. Jem is crying and angry. He thought that the case was clearly in Tom's favor. Atticus is exhausted, and when Jem asks him how the jury could have done it, he responds, I don't know, but they did it. They've done it before, and they did it tonight, and they'll do it again. And when they do it, hi, girl. Seems like only children weep. However, however, the next morning he explains that there's a good possibility. Here's Jamie. Let me find uh, where I was at. However, the next morning explains that there's a good possibility for the case to be appealed in a higher court. Calpurnia reveals that the black community has left Atticus 
Hi, girlfriend. All sorts of appreciative gifts, including chickens. Bread and produce that have filled the house. Upon seeing this generosity, Atticus's eyes fill with tears. He says he's very grateful, but tells Calperna that they shouldn't give him such things when times are so hard. Dill comes by for breakfast and tells everyone that Miss Rachel thinks that if a man like Atticus Finch wants to butt his head against a stone wall, it's his head. The children go outside and Miss Marty saves them from Miss Stephanie's nosy gossip by inviting them over for cake. Miss Marty says that Atticus is someone who does other people's unpleasant jobs for them. Jem is discouraged and disappointed with the people of Maycomb, who he whom he formerly thought were the best people in the world. He thinks that no one but Atticus worked on Tom's behalf. And Miss Marty <coughs> points out that many people helped, including Mr. Tate, the sheriff of the black community, especially Mr. Taylor, the judge who offered Atticus the case in the first place. Mr. Tate assigned Atticus to the case because he knew Atticus would truly dedicate himself to the cause. Miss Marty says that even though she knew Atticus wouldn't win, couldn't win, he did manage to keep the jury out in discussion for longer than anyone else could, which is an achievement in, in, in and of itself. She says, we are making a step. It's just a baby step, but it's a step. As they leave, Dill says he wants to be a clown when he grows up because there ain't one thing in this world I can do about folks except laugh. So I'm going to join the circus and laugh my head off. The children see Mr. Avery. Miss Stephanie and Miss Rachel discussing something with animation in the street. Apparently, Mr. Ewell saw Atticus by the post office, spat in his face, and told him that he'd get him if it took him the rest of his life. Chapter 23 Summary Atticus is unconcerned about Mr. Ewell's threat and tells his worried children that Mr. Ewell, who has been publicly discredited by the trial, just needs to feel like he is retaliating against someone and that better it be Atticus than the Ewell children. Tom is being held on a prison farm, and his wife and his children are not permitted to visit him. Atticus thinks that there's a good chance he'll be spared execution by having his sentence commuted by the governor. Atticus com comments that too many people are sent to death based upon purely circumstantial evidence. Jem thinks that juries should be done away with because they can't make reasonable decisions. But I disagree with them, too. We need juries, too. It's just that back in the old South that they were kind of biased against. In some respects, I think they're still biased. But a single judge would be biased, too. We like the tyrant. Anyway. Atticus responds that men don't behave rationally in some situations. It will always take a white man's word of a black man's. Atticus tells Jem that any white man who cheats a black man is trash. Chem and Atticus talk about what keeps people off of juries. Women can't serve on juries in Alabama, which Scout takes exception to. And many people don't want to get involved in court cases because their livelihood depends in some way upon maintaining good favor with both parties involved in a case. Jem thinks that the jury decided quickly, but Atticus reminds him that it took a few hours, which is much longer than usual. Typically, a case like that like Tom's, would be settled in a matter of minutes. Atticus sees this as a sign of the beginning of the change for the better. Also, Atticus reveals <laughs> that he learned that the one jury member who kept everyone out so long was a Cunningham who defended Tom's innocence. <clears throat> Atticus thinks that all Cunninghams will stand solidly behind anyone who wins their respect without fail in this incident at the Jailhouse won the Finch family great respect. Upon learning that his father believed Tom to be innocent, Scout wants to invite Walter Cunningham over for lunch more often. But Aunt Alexander puts her foot down, saying that the Cunninghams aren't the right sort of people for Scout to spend time with. Scout can be gracious to Walter and polite, but can't invite him over because he is trash, which is BS. Scout is upset about this and goes to Jem to talk about it. Jem tries to cheer her up and proudly shows her the beginnings of chest hair, which Scout pretends to see and congratulates him on. Jem explains he wants to go out for football next year. Next, Jem tries to comfort Scout by explaining that. Aunt Alexander just trying to make her into a lady. He says that there are four different kinds of people in Maycomb County. 
ordinary people like themselves, people like the Cunninghams in the woods, people like the Yules by the dump, and black people each class looks down upon and despises the class below it. The two try to resolve exactly what separates and distinguishes the categories of white people. You know, that's one thing I like about animals, is that they don't look down upon each other. Only, only people. People are, humans are just a scourge. Background doesn't seem to matter because all the families are e equally old. Jem thinks these class definitions have to do with how long the family has been literate. Scout disgraces and disagrees with things. There's just one kind of folks. F folks. Jem says he used to think so as well, but he doesn't understand why they despise one another, if that's the case. Jem seems very frustrated with society and adds that maybe Boo Radley stays inside because he wants to. Because he doesn't want to be part of the BS. Who needs it? Chapter 24. Jam and Dill have gone swimming and wouldn't let Scout come along because they were planning to skinny dip. Aunt Alexandra's ladies over for a meeting of the Missionary Society of Maycomb and keeps Scout in attendance in order for her to learn to be a lady. The women discuss the plight of the Maruna people, a non-Christian group in Africa who are said to live in squalor to being converted thanks to the efforts of a missionary named J. Grimes Everett. You know, kind of interesting, and I'm not saying anything bad about Christian people, but I mean, there were people around before Christians. So were they bad, <laughs> bad before Christ, before uh, the Christians came around, or the heathens? No. Human races, I don't think I understand them myself. Okay. Scout doesn't enjoy being around women, but does her best to take part. The discussion moves toward the topic of Tom's wife, Helen. Apparently the black cooks and field hands in town were discontented during the week after the trial. One of the ladies comments on how much she dislikes a sulky darky and says that when the black female servant was slow to perform her duties following the trial, she reminded her that Jesus never complained. Another lady says that no amount of education will ever make Christians out of black people and that there's no safe lady in her these bed and her safe and there's no lady safe in her bed these days. I mean Christians have only been around for a few thousand years. So how could they think that they, you know, the Almighty <coughs> takes exception over them? I mean, I've got nothing against people who are Christian or whatever. I mean, my family's was always Christian, but I, I just I don't I just don't get it. I I, I never did. I I, I just I guess I could never wrap my mind around how other people could decide that they were right and other people were wrong, and then kill over because you're right and I'm wrong and. I never could wrap my mind around that injustice, and I don't know. It's just I know I'm not perfect, but I know I never could wrap my mind around something like that. How other people can treat each other badly, I just don't know. I don't want anything to do with people like that. I'd rather be alone. I'd rather be alone, with my cats. I mean, I have somebody in my life and he's a good man and, but I don't know if he was if he if I felt like he was like that he, I would, and he's not anyway let me get off my soapbox and off my right I'm not, I'm not trying to say that I'm better than anybody else I just can't wrap and in the way I think but I just can't wrap my mind around other people thinking they're better than other people I don't know let me get back to the summary I'm and that there's no safe lady in her bed these days, nights. Miss Maudie tersely shows her different opinion on this topic. On Alexander magically smooths everything over. Another lady says that Northerners are hypocrites who claim to give blacks equal standing that actually don't mix socially with them. Whereas in the South, people are very upfront about their lack of desire to share the same lifestyle. Scout remembers that Halperna told Atticus at the date. Tom went to prison. He lost hope. Atticus couldn't prove, promise Tom an acquittal, so he didn't try to reason, reassure Tom by giving potentially false hope. Suddenly, Atticus enters the house. 
the request on Alexander. Calpurnia is present in the kitchen. He reveals that Tom tried to escape from prison and was shot to death by the prison guards. He'd probably rather just go through and go through what he's gonna go through. He might as well just, you know, go out his own way. Apparently the guards tried to tell him to stop and fired warning shots, but Tom kept running. Atticus needs Calpurnia to go with him to Tom's wife to give her the news. The two of them go leaving Aunt Alexandra. They tell Miss Marty in the kitchen that she's concerned about Atticus. The trial has taken a lot of out of him and it seems to be unending. Miss Marty thinks that the town has paid Atticus a high tribute by trusting him to do right and uphold justice. These people are the small handful who know that blacks should be given justice and who have background. The two women are quite shaken but then join the other women effortless, effortlessly. Scout feels proud of her aunt and of Miss Marty, and for the first time feels inclined to be ladylike, thinking that if Annie could be a lady in a time like this, so could I. Analysis. Tom's crippled state is more than just a plot of device. It also serves as an emblem to the disadvantage in his life as a black man. His arm was injured in a cotton gin, a machine used primarily by slaves, and later poor black workers in the cotton fields. The legacy of slave slavery cripples Tom in court and in his everyday life, just as his actual injury is a constant burden to him. Miela's sad situation comes out more fully in Tom's testimony. Her short comment about what her pat do to her don't count, hints that her father probably abused her, possibly sexually, most likely, considering what she was trying to get Tom to do with her. Miela is as lonely as the mixed children Jem spoke of earlier, as she belongs to neither black nor white circles. The idea that a black person could feel sorry for a white person refutes all of Maycomb's social assumptions, making Tom's courthouse comment extremely provocative. By nature, black life is thought to be inferior to white life, making Tom's feelings towards male is subvert everything that the town's social fabric is based upon. As Jem explains in Chapter 23, every class looks down upon the class below it, so black people as the lowest class should not feel pity for anyone. I don't know, I think it's some people's way of making them feel good inside. Inside, they're just deeply, they're just, they're just pathetic. Souls that really have nothing. We're, we're just scourges on this earth. All of us. Dill's feeling realness during Mr. Gilmer's cross-examination shows his extreme sensitivity as a young child. The ugliness of society's prejudices and evil. Scout tries to see Mr. Gilmer's actions as part of the method of the job he's trying to do, following Atticus's advice to try to get into a person's mind in order to understand them better. However, it is indisputable that Mr. Gilmer does not behave as honorably as Atticus. Atticus speaks to all the witnesses with respect, while Mr. Gilmer demeans Tom in court, calling him boy and snaring at him. Dill's classic method of managing uncomfortable situations is to run away, and he does so here, fleeing the courtroom, scout at his side. Chapter 20, Atticus appeals to the jury's sense of dignity in putting together the facts of the case. He stresses the simplicity of the evidence and shows that the facts point toward Tom's innocence. As later it becomes apparent, Atticus doesn't really believe that the jury will set Tom free, even though he hopes they will as evidence by his final statement upon his breath. In the name of God, believe him. All Atticus can hope for is to leave an impression upon the town by exposing the truth for all to see. Atticus's treatment of Mayella reveals that, though a victim of many cruelties, she has chosen to bring cruelty upon Tom. Must not be excused for this. As he points out, Mayella wants to protect herself by placing her guilt on Tom, knowing that her actions will bring about his death because the jury will believe her a white woman, not him, a black man. Then she manipulates the unfairness of her society towards her own ends. Mr. Raymond, as Scout notes elsewhere, is a person of high enough social standing that he can act in a very unorthodox way and have his behavior accepted, not only because, as he says, he gives the people a reason with which to interpret his behavior, but also through the usual expression, it's just his way. The ability to be pardoned for certain eccentricities isn't allowed to people of all levels of society. Mr. Raymond owns a great deal of land and is a successful businessman. However, if an unusual displayed similar behavior, he or she would not be excused so easily. By chapter 21, Jem was sure that the trial will go in Tom's favor, well, the naivety of a child, 
after all the evidence was revealed. I mean, he did understand the full scope of his society, but I myself <laughs> can be pretty naive. I always hope for the best, but sometimes it doesn't happen. Therefore, the pronouncement of guilt comes as a complete surprise to his naive, naive mind, and he feels physical pain upon hearing each jury member's guilt. Guilty. Jem is physiologically wounded by the results of the trial, feeling that his previously good opinion of the people of Mako and people in general has been seriously marred. So, I mean, he's lost a bit of his childhood that way. Jem's trust in the rationality of the people has been beset by the knowledge that people can act in irrationally evil ways. He finds himself struggling to conceive of how otherwise good people can behave terribly through at the remainder of the book. Despite the unfavorable verdict, the black community pays tribute to Atticus for the respect he has shown the community and the human race. Atticus dedicates, dedicated himself to the trial, which everyone knew was a lost cause. I mean, there are all, always those good people out there. He tried as best as he could to allow Tom to go free and work to teach the townspeople a lesson by exposing the unfairness of their collective opinions. Just as he fathers Jem and Scout and good moral value, value virtues, Try to teach the town a lesson and infuse them with more virtuous ideas. In chapter 22, Atticus reaches a point of frustration immediately after the trial, but his usual optimism returns the next day when he begins talking about the chance for an appeal. Through the, though he acknowledges that they'll do it again and understands the reality that evil will always persist in some form, he seems to need to believe that there is hope for the future and the inherent goodness of mankind in order to keep himself going. Exhausted and pessimistic the night after the trial, he seems restored the next morning, as if his ability to exist and his hope are closely intertwined. Miss Marty makes Jem aware of an entire network of people who are quietly working in Tom's favor. Her use of the word we to represent them not only creates the sense that there is a cohesive group with a communal vision, but also makes the children feel like they are now included as part of, part of it. The trial has affected their lives in many ways, and now they are aware that they are, by default, going to be part of the ongoing aim of taking steps towards fairness and equality. Dill's comment about being a clown follows his tendency for escapism. He finds reality so difficult to manage that he defines himself in another way, a separate reality where he can be safe from the trauma that Jem feels and the confusion that Scout feels as a result of being so closely in the time trying to the town's event. Dill also seems to typify a certain type idea of the work of the artist in his efforts to create a separate reality of himself that serves as a vantage point from which to see the events going on in the world. He receives things well but will not become caught up in them. We'll treat everything as a performance that is ultimately meaningful only in that it is a reaction against the real. Atticus is overly hopeful again in Chapter 23. His opinion of Mr. Yule shows a lack of understanding the ultimate possibility for evil inherent in some people. Jem is unsure whether people can be trusted to serve on juries based on the jury that served in Tom's case. And Atticus points out some of the factors that make juries less than ideal. Some people are not willing to do right by serving on a jury because they fear public opinion. For instance, a shop owner would not want to lose business by sitting on a jury in a dispute between two customers. Fear seems to be the main motivating factor that makes individuals shirk the task of upholding what they know to be right. Also, Atticus points out the state itself is unfair by not allowing women, or for that matter, blacks, to serve on juries. Even after all the events of the trial, Scout continues to believe that all people are the same. She believes all people are folks, that they are neither all good nor all bad. Sometimes they act out of weakness. I like that about She's mind of a child, but that's good. She can't determine what makes her family better than the Cunninghams. Well, she's right there, they're not. Jem seems to still want a reason to explain why. Some people act the way they do, he feels, that he is outgrown. Scout's viewpoint and needs a new one that is calibrated to his more mature mind. His comment about Boo shows that on the whole he is feeling mistrustful towards humanity. Understandable. Just as chapter 12 gives insight into black society in Maycomb, chapter 24 gives insight to white women's society. 
Scout's experience with the missionary society is somewhat mixed. She observes the hypocrisy with which the women try to do good for a remote culture like the Marunas, but neglect the need and suffering of the black community in their own town. Particularly disconcerting is the way the women discriminate freely against blacks. Planning about sulky darkies and making ridiculous insinuations that black men spurred on by the trial will start coming into their beds. The women provincialism comes out when they speak of the Maruna people. It is evident that they have no understanding of how another way of worship could be just as spiritually meaningful as the religion they have always known. Like I said, these religions have been around a lot longer than Christianity. I mean, I'm, did are all those people going to hell? I mean, it just to, doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. And I'm not saying, like I said, I don't see anything wrong with I believe personally, and this is my thought about religion. It's not religion. Religion is, how do I explain it? It's man made. Religion is man made. It comes from humans, from people. Spirituality comes from God and from Him and what you experience through Him. And I think a lot of people have lost that. And that's how they, why they think that somehow they think they're better than other people because other people live differently, and that's it's not true. I mean, some people unfortunately are not blessed with that they're a little more handicapped intellectually, but that does not make any anybody any better. Miss Marty is the only woman. Let me see where I was. Okay. They also refuse to believe that the blacks of Macomb are Christians. Although as shown in chapter 12, they're clearly worshipping the same God, like what I was just saying. Ms. Marty is the only one who seems to show any appreciation for conscience. <clears throat> but when she speaks up on Alexandra is required by civil code to move the conversation pleasant again. Thus the lady see, never seemed to discuss anything meaningful. Throughout the book, women are often described in relation to sweet things. For instance, chapter one, they're described as soft tea cakes with frostings of sweet and talcum. Miss Carolyn is described as looking like a peppermint drop. The ladies gathered at the Finch household are said to smell heavenly, make many remarks about Aunt Alexander's dainty tarts. Even Miss Maudie is best known outside of her gardening for her cake, and Aunt Alexander is famous for her Christmas dinner. Women seem in these descriptions somewhat superficial and transient. The delicate desserts they seem to epitomize are hardly fortifying or necessary. They mainly look pretty and behave pleasantly, black real substance. Scout, who has a very strong sense of character, does not fit this comparison and finds fights against becoming a part of this community. When meaningful news does arrive, the women are spared from hearing it. As Atticus takes on Alexander and to the kitchen, the news of Tom's attempt at escape and his loss of his hope after his sentence occurs in the middle of the women's meeting by doing good in the world, which points to hypocrisy and wasted moral zeal and gives context to Tom's feelings of hopelessness. However, Scout does not does note that there's an element of cha challenge involved in being a lady. I mean, I, I don't ever talk this way, but I mean, a woman can be a, can be a lady and also intelligent too but then there's different times too so but although there's some prejudice still I don't ever get into it because I couldn't care less she understands this when watching on Alexandra and Miss Marty put themselves together at the hearing the tragic news and joining the group the ability to maintain the appearance of tact and civility above all other events strikes Scout as an appealing skill and that's the end of the summary and to uh chapters 19 through 24 and I'm going to stop there and tomorrow I will get into chapter <coughs> 25 or 26 uh, just a reminder please stay safe and healthy and please check out more from Classic Books of Ostara and hit the notification bell like, subscribe, comment below and say goodnight Jamie